and I just doing an inverted flight, just inverted flight, and just about center point, all of a sudden, the engine quit. Now, let me explain something to you. When an engine quits in an airplane and you've got one engine, that is the loudest quiet you will ever hear in your life. Long-time listeners of the Fighter Pilot Podcast probably recognize the name Jerry Tucker. Well, that's because he was our guest on episode 50 discussing the F-8 Crusader way back in 2019. And today he returns here at the Circle Air Group Studios in Gillespie Field, San Diego, California, to talk about your time with the Blue Angels. Hello, Turkey. Welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me again. This yeah. is fun. Well, and again is right because, let's see, after episode 50, you helped us with a live Facebook a meeting or whatever, a discussion. Then I think we did a live Zoom for our Patreon supporters. And then I think, did you make it to our premiere of the Top Gun Maverick? Yes, oh, did we? Yes, In May of 2022, yeah. that was a day that I was just, everything was a blur, so. I'm sure it Sorry, was. I don't remember exactly, <laughs> but. All right, well, you are a good friend of the show, thanks. And uh, what's new since we've seen you last? Oh, not much. I've uh, been trying to stay out of trouble and failing miserably, according <laughs> to my wife, anyway. Uh, but uh, things have been pretty quiet. Just, okay. Just hanging around, playing Good. a little golf. Good. Well, you and Sunshine, our former host, uh, had a great discussion on the F8 on episode 50. You touched a little bit on your time on the blues, and I thought you'd be a great guest, not only because you're here in San Diego, close to the studio, but because everybody loves not only the F4, but the Blue Angel F4. I mean, just doing a little research for today, I found a Twitter group, I think, or at least a handle. There's a YouTube channel. There's all kinds of stuff out there. There's quite a, quite a few things. There's a kid uh, named uh, Ryan Notif that has his YouTube channel called Blue Angel Phantoms. Okay. And Ryan, um, this is a good plug for him, too, because sure. he deserves it. He was made an honorary Blue Angel uh, this last reunion. Ryan is the grandson of Butch Voris, who started the Blue Angels. Okay. And when the Blues uh, Korea came around, uh, they disbanded the Blues and they formed a, a VF-191 uh, that went to uh, Vietnam and their CO was Butch Voris. Uh, when the war was over and they disbanded it, they had to uh, restart the Blues. And so who did they bring in to restart them? <laughs> Butch Voris. Uh, uh, Ryan's never been in the service, but he wanted to give back to his grandfather, who, who he greatly admired for, for good reason. And uh, they started... Uh, he started this uh, Blue Angel Phantoms, and I was uh, lucky enough to be one of his uh, first victims uh -huh. uh, where he came down to the house and, and, uh, and filmed it, and he's created the Bluetooth uh, or the uh, YouTube channel. Sure. And, uh, and it's doing quite well. He's brought some other people in, some uh, Thunderbirds there as well, okay. and uh, uh, just, just some guys that were uh, in, uh, had, had a checkered past like mine and uh, <laughs> a really good kid. Good. Uh, so. Well, we can maybe put a link in the show notes or put yeah, a hyperlink on there. Everybody the, will enjoy it. I promise. And uh, check it minutes. out. Yeah, absolutely. Good. All right. Well, like I said, that's where I want to spend the bulk of our time today because I'm also fascinated with the blues. When I first saw them, uh, it was in 1978. So it was, as we'll get to in a moment, right between, uh, I was eight years old at Point Magoo and they were flying the, fan, uh, the Skyhawks. And uh, it's not something I tried to do ever, but I have a lot of respect for them and, and just had a chance to see them in Miramar here uh, in San Diego. So, all right. So you were prior to, uh, let's see, how do I start this? You were an F-8 Crusader guy. And then I think after Vietnam, you were at the FRS. And was that for the F-8? Uh, yes, it was the F-8 rag there at Miramar. Okay. Uh, uh, the war was still on. Uh, okay. I, I'd left the, the squadron in 72 and uh, had orders as uh, one of the LSOs in the RAG. Uh, okay, the, the landing squad. signal officer. Right. Okay, and while you were there, at some point you decided to rush the Blues or had, uh, someone else suggested it? I had actually rushed them before, uh, before we went on cruise, but I didn't have enough time at the time. You had to have a 1,000 hours uh, before you could even uh, put an application in. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were going on cruise. I wasn't going to leave early for heaven's sake. And um, so I had uh, reached out. A friend of mine was on the team, Steve Lambert, and uh, and I, I knew one of the other guys, too, uh, that I'd met around. Mm -hmm. uh, but Steve was an F-8 pilot as well, so we, uh, we knew each other quite well. Okay. Uh, and he'd been in 211, which was the squadron I was in during the war. And uh, so when I got back from cruise, I, I gave him a call and said, hey, we're back, and I'm still interested. And he, he allowed us how the, uh, well, we've uh, just finished our, our selections, and 
Um, and it's a little too late for that. He says, well, that's okay. I just want you to know I'm interested for next year. Sure. And uh, uh, he said, that's great. Well, he called back two days later or the, or the next day maybe and said, hey, uh, Turk, you still interested? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, it was just yesterday. Of course I am. <laughs> uh, he says, well, we got a show in Point Magoo. Can you uh, come? The uh, We've had a, a small hiccup in the selection. Sure. And uh, so I did. I went up to Point Magoo and uh, – I had a great time at the show. Got to meet the rest of the guys that uh, uh, that I didn't know. Um, and um, I'm trying to think. I think it was uh, uh, Don Bentley was the le- uh, leader at the time. And uh, 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 Bill Beardsley was on the team at the time. And Steve was uh, oppo- opposing solo. And Skip uh, Umstead was the lead solo for okay. the team at the time. And um, uh, went back to Marimar, went back to work, getting ready for the boat. And... Uh, uh, Steve called again uh, the next week. Say, hey, can can you come to Pensacola? <laughs> well, yeah, sure. I'd love love to come down. It'd be fun. I'll see I'll see if I can get a plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did. I got a cross country set up and went down and uh, landed and pulled into ops and parking. Uh, guy right behind me on final was a guy named Vance Parker, uh, who had been an applicant, but he didn't have enough flight time at the time. Mm. So, but he was coming down the party. It was uh, close to the end of the season party. And uh, uh, so he and I met each other there. We'd never met before. And as it turns out, Vance wound up being my opposing solo in, in, in the A4. Okay, so before we get too far, yeah. because had you been selected before deployment, you wouldn't have had your great mix scare, right? That That's wasn't correct. It? Okay, That's correct. so anyone's wondering about that, go check out episode 50 that you discussed that, uh, yeah. the most cost-efficient kill of the war. Um, but as far as the selection process goes, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but when I was at Top Gun, and we would consider prospective Top Gun instructors, Mm -hmm. we were always more interested in the person than the skills because you can build the skills with repetition and maybe a little more training. It's hard to build the right personality. And again, having never rushed the blues or or been a part of it, was it similar? Were they looking for a person who's going to be good on the show line after the show, or is it? I think so. Uh, Actually, we placed the greatest um, weight uh, in the selection process on exes that might have known the guy because an ex blue really understand what it takes okay. to be on the team and, and do the, uh, be able to handle I don't want to say pressure but there there was pressures both uh, personal pressures uh, civilian type pressures and besides the flying uh, flight pressures there's a lot of flying going on mm-hmm. and um, so I think it's a little bit of both uh, when I went down to that party I I had didn't know I'd been selected. That's when I, they told me that the oh, party, wow. that I'd been selected and told me, okay, you're the only one we've told, so you can't tell anybody. Here I am at a party with 200 <laughs> of my closest friends. I think I knew Vance because I'd met him there before. Right. And uh, and I couldn't tell a soul that I'd just been selected for the team the way they, the way they did it. Uh. And I, uh, so uh, I went back um, back home, and I couldn't tell anybody there either. And I was single at the time, so, but it, that, that was that was the hardest part. I'll and bet. as it turns out, the uh, they had selected uh, uh, the original selection. They selected four, uh, four, I believe it was, or three attack pilots. And the admiral was an old fighter pilot. And he said, "No, you're not going to do that." I said, "I want some fighter pilots on the team. No, that's it." <laughs> well, so okay. That, so well, that, to your benefit, it worked out for me. Oh, wow. Admiral, Admiral Jim Ferris. I, okay, yeah, yeah, bless you, his heart. You bless probably his, uh, rest oh, his soul. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say you probably he never bought a drink around you. No, he no, I wouldn't allow that. That's <laughs> for sure. So when that happens, right, right, does the giant trump card, if you will, of all cards get thrown to Millington? And maybe it wasn't Millington at the time. But in other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing. They're going to get you. As oh, far as, oh, and that's a good thing, right? But well, it, you uh, got pulled the, out of your FRS tour. Well, it, uh, it, uh, it, it ha- the way it happens is that uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened back in D.C. because they handle that end. But it just happened. But it went from the admiral. The admiral goes says, I want this, this okay. guy. And what they did is myself. They also picked uh, John Shahansky and, and John Fogg. Uh, John uh, Shahansky, Smoke is his call sign, and Foggy, John Fogg, were Phantom guys. Smoke and Fogg. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, I was the F-8 guy. Okay. And, and one of the other selectees uh, of the Ace 7 guys, Marlon Weaver, he, he remained. Okay. And uh, so uh, they went and they approved them. And it came down, down the, of course, the Admiral approved them. Okay. Once they said it was okay from D.C., but they, they go through the puzzle palace does that sure stuff, you know, no idea so at some point you're allowed to tell people and at some yeah. point orders start rolling in so you had flown the f8 exclusively up till then that's correct 
Is this then when you went to F4 training? Yeah, I just time? went down to 121, VF1. Right down the street down in the Miramar. Street, mm-hmm. And uh, I got um, four flights. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's, that's it. Because they didn't care if you knew how to shoot a missile or drop a bomb or land on the boat. That's correct. I'm guessing. That's they wanted correct. you to be safe in the airplane. That, I, I had four flights. Yep. I had, uh, yeah, four, four flights. It took a week, and, uh, and I uh, was qualified, and uh, away I went. Hmm. All right. So when you show up now, let's just talk through this journey of yours. Uh, at what point? So when did all this? Ha- what, what what time of seventy two are we talking? This Spring, was uh, summer, fall, fall, the fall. Yeah. Okay. Back because you're the... going to be then on the following year's team, right? That's You've right. got some time. Okay. I think it was probably November. I didn't bring my logbook, but I think it was October, November is when I went to the RAG. Okay. And as soon as I got uh, done there, then I went right back to the team. And uh, the season was. Ba- I don't think I got went, went to any other shows that year. Okay. I think when I got there, it, uh, we, we went right to work. Went uh, right to work. Yeah. And so even though they're based in Pensacola, they do their winter training out in El Centro. El Centro. Was that true then That's as well? Correct. Oh, yeah. Okay, because yeah. it's wide open. and All right. And good, then good weather, too. Is it, I would assume, crawl, walk, run? I mean, not only are you new to the team, but you're new to the airplane. We started flying in Pensacola before I got out there. Okay. Uh, as soon as I got back there, we did uh, one, one or two a day um, in Pensacola. Uh, mm-hmm. our, our area that we worked on in the Phantom was... Uh, um, a stretch of beach out by Mobile. It's in Florida, but it's right at the tip of that little panhandle area mm-hmm. out there on on the water. And we'd uh, use the coastline was the uh, run-in line, and uh, we had some houses where our checkpoints, and the people <laughs> didn't care. They loved it. They had an air show every day. <laughs> That's right. uh, things were a little different. Yeah, people yeah. were accepted, uh, accepted the military back in those the days. The world was different. Yeah, it was. So when you were accepted that time you were designated if you will or, or selected as a solo uh, uh right? yes yes you come so on does, board yeah how does that happen good why question. that instead of dash two or three or four good question okay they, that's all done inside um when when uh we for 74 uh you know we had we'll talk about that later but it was the same thing i think i saw who was coming in and i i, I want him as my solo and i got him and it was Vance. And so when you get picked, because there's the diamond and then there's the solos, and of course they all fly together at port, parts of the show. But is is getting a solo card, if you will, like getting the golden ticket? I mean, is that... Uh, you know, in my mind, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to be a drone. I wanted to be a star. Okay. That's <laughs> that's what we called them. So drones okay. and stars. Um, Even within such a small group, there's oh, still... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they, oh, <laughs> of course, yes. Of course. Come on. We're fighter pilots. We're having sex. And, I, and, I, and one token attack puke. Um, so um, uh, when I went back this, uh, back to the team in 79, they'd already chosen, but it was, it's the guy I would have chosen anyway because I nice. knew him from the F-14 rag, John nice. Ross. Okay. So, um, and, you know, it used to be uh, number two was always uh, the Marine. And that kind of changed about uh, that time. Okay. Um, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. Some uh, things happened. There was internal politics uh, that happened before I uh, got there that I had uh, wasn't part of. Didn't want to know. Hmm. You know that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, I was where I wanted to be. So, and <laughs> and the training was it was great. We. Uh, uh, they knew I could fly the airplane. I could, you know, get it started, get it airborne. Past that, they taught me everything else. Uh, you know, the the, the uh, emergency procedures and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. That's a that's a no brainer. We knew that before we. Sure. I had that before I ever had my first flight in in it, and that that right. was like three days after or two days after I got got selected. But how different are the Crusader and the Phantom? I feel like they're different. Never night, flew night either and one. Day, night and day. Okay. Uh, the Phantom is the most stable airplane I've ever flown. I mean, uh, easiest thing in the world uh, to land. I, I can't talk about the boat because I never took it aboard. I wish I had. The F-8, every, every correction is three corrections. You know, you raise the nose, you know, add the power, you know, drop the nose a little bit, take off some power. You're mm-hmm. constantly chasing it. Mm-hmm. The Phantom, you set the nose, you trim the speed, and you you just use the throttles. On episode 50, you talked about doing a PAR, and you never had to. <laughs> it was my second PAR, <laughs> yeah. hands off. Yeah. All I did was, uh, I, I was there, but I didn't touch it. Yeah. And I used to sit here and I could, I controlled everything with the power. It's the most stable airplane I've ever seen. Because it's just it's so rudder, big. a little rudder. It takes, I guess. It takes, uh, what, force, right? A lot of force to move something with a lot of mass. I guess. <laughs> and it's, well, it's just designed with stability yeah. uh, inherent okay. in the thing. You know, it's, uh, the anhedral uh, and dihedral you see in that, it, it, it worked. Right. That's what those things were put for. And it worked. 
Uh, and ours were a little different. They didn't. Uh, uh, the original Phantom had bellows uh, air that went in the tail that gave uh, the feel, the pull on the stick. Uh, so the faster you went, you had more going in there, and it got metered, but but uh, it got harder to pull. But uh, we put springs in because we couldn't have that. It right. had, we have something consistent. We, the bellows, I think, were part of the reason they had to be on the stick on a catapult shot. Again, you never took it to the boat, but I forget what guest we had that talked about that. Yeah. All right, so when you got to the team in the Phantom, it wasn't their first year, but I guess it was probably their last year. As, we as it turns about. out, it was their last it, year. Okay, uh, but... Talk about that. So they came from what airplane to the Phantom, and then how long did the Phantom last? Uh, Phantom was four years, I think. Okay. Uh, they came from the F-11, um, and they uh, they had a dynamic transition too. They had had some some uh, little issues, uh, you know, some uh, getting to know the airplane because mm-hmm. the F-11 was a good little airplane, but it was real stable as well. But it uh, didn't have the kind of power that the Phantom had in it, and uh, the ability to. Uh, to fly fast, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, easy. It's easy to approach the uh, the, the number, ah. uh, which you had to be real careful of. Well, I have a know. listener question coming up about that, but so, but to your point about it being such a stable aircraft, right? Maneuverability, mm-hmm. stability uh, are sometimes or all the time somewhat uh, at odds with each other. So, how, how did how did it do in the show? And it was good in formation. It was very good. It was uh, such a uh, stable airplane. Um, it, it didn't do funny things in uh, in, in the uh, uh, in the air show. Uh, you t- we t- we flew full nose down, so if, you know you're, you're you've got something uh, solid that you're always pulling against. So you, uh, you realize that it's not going to get funny. So uh, you you can depend on that, and it's there. So you can fly really close. And when I said we were two to three feet, we were even even in Delta, we could, we would fly there. You could. You've seen the movies in, in uh, Threshold and those things where you see the the, the wingtips kind of wiggling around. That's mm-hmm. about all you ever got out of it. <laughs> there wasn't a real um, uh, suck under thing. What can happen sometimes if you get too close to somebody, you can get actually sucked under them. Uh. It, uh, it can push the wing down and there's nothing you can really do to stop. I've mm. had that happen in the, in the Crusader before. Uh, Phantom, never, we never had that. And plus you had somebody over there that was... Um, it was it, his air was pushing you back too. So you, uh, but it was constant. I mean, it was stable, and yeah. uh, you didn't have to fight it too much. Um, in the Phantom, if you ever got in trouble or felt what you were uncomfortable, you didn't get wider or go clear. You got closer because whatever he was doing, and, and that that was goes right directly to trust too. Mm-hmm. But whatever he's doing, if he's flying, you're flying too. Yeah, and you can put it there and hold it there. Uh, there were several times. I mean, I can remember going in a cloud uh, at Rota, Spain, when we did uh, the tour in the Phantom over there, and I am two feet from the guy, and he disappears. Wow. I mean, it was the cloud was that thick, and I just said, I know he's going to be there, and I know if I see anything, I know I can react because, fortunately, I'm on the end, outside. You know, I'm <laughs> at the very tip. I can uh-huh. I can push away, and when he popped out, he was still there. It didn't move. Um, <laughs> Didn't happen a lot, but that that was one thing that did happen yeah. at this time. Wow. Um, the, tra- uh, the the learning part in the airplane, Steve Lambert and I would go out and uh, like to the area I told you uh, out by Mobile, uh, in the uh, in the Panhandle of Florida, and uh, we'd just do flat passes. We, we'd practice timing and and uh, we'd stand by market, uh, and when you, market was click click click, and you know your clock was going, it, it would stop, reset, and go is the three that which did. And 30 seconds later, you had to be down at the two-mile uh, two checkpoint. You had a three-mile checkpoint. You know that you used that going in. And we got where we could do it every time. Yeah. I'm going to be a little late. Okay, you'd slow down a little bit to give them a chance. And we would hit it on altitude and on airspeed. Hmm. Airspeed being 500 knots for most of the maneuvers, 550 for the rules. Yeah. Um, I can remember the first day we went to practice inverted flight. I, I I mean, I'd been inverted, you know, everybody's done that. Sure. At, you know, 25, 30,000 feet, it's pretty easy to do. So I said, I started climbing. Steve said, where are you going? I said, I thought we'd go to a safe altitude. I said, this is safe. So, so we, at 1,000 feet, yeah, yeah. Uh, first time, you know, you get, roll upside down. He said, okay, now just, okay, you're, you're going down, you're descending a little, okay, okay, there, that's level. And he said, get a, uh, get a mark on the in the cockpit. So, I mean, you're looking... Uh, two bolts. I knew what bolts was. That between those two bolts, the high horizon there, your level. And then you get used to it. Then we slowly started moving it mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. 
Did the airplane need modifications to fly longer than normal inverted? Uh, yeah, they changed something. And I, um, that was either oil or fuel. It was fuel. Right? Was it was it okay. fuel in that. And uh, and I think there might have been a small oil mod too, but I'm not as much as the fuel. They okay. did something to the fuel tank. We yeah. had the biggest change was in the A4. The A4, we had a big mod. Okay, well, we'll get to that one. You know, Turkey, one thing I've always wondered, having flown a handful of formation flights myself, is when I'm on the right wing of mm -hmm. someone flying as wingman, I, that to me feels more natural as a right-handed pilot, you know, looking in that direction. Mm -hmm. I always wondered, because I never felt as comfortable on the left, for the for the diamond pilots, do they just get used to it? Or is the left wing, I think that's number three, right? Oh, uh, yes. Is that generally known as harder or am I just weird? No, that, that's <laughs> that's all you see, so it doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, you, there are maneuvers where you're going to get both mm -hmm. because they do echelon. Everybody's looking that's to the left. Yeah. But it's the diamond, uh, any, any of the diamond work, you, you get mm -hmm. used to it. Well, you flew as Delta 5 and 6. That's correct. So d you never felt that it didn't matter if you were looking right, looking left, per se? Uh, at the beginning, yes, I had a bit of an issue. Uh, once uh, I was going to be number five, now we're in, uh, when I'm going to be number five, we're in the A4 now. Okay. And we had uh, done done a little bit of work in it. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember. No, nah, Steve took me out. We had, I think, two or three Phantoms still left when we went out at first. But we'd go up and start, we'd do rolls. I had to get on the other wing, and I'd do, roll on his wing. And I got it right about here every time, and I, I lost it. <laughs> he says, you know, you're eventually, you're going to have to get around one of these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, who's flying that airplane? Are you flying it or is it flying you? And that's what brought it home. That was the last time. Okay, huh? who's in charge here? So uh, the next one, I got it all the way around. But it's an odd feeling because now they're rolling into you and, and, and you lose the horizon. Instead of uh, making the horizon go away, you, it's lost immediately because you're looking up and, it, and the horizon mm -hmm. has gone away from so you have to trust him, yeah. even more trust than normal. But it took th it took me th the third time that I finally got around in one of those roles on the left wing. Okay. So midway through your first year as a Blue Angel, which already I would think is you're gone a lot. It's You're flying close proximity. You're flying a lot. You're flying a new airplane relatively. You put a lot of hours in it right away. But now, right, some point in this year they said, okay, well, we're done with the Phantom. And we can talk about some reasons why. But... Now you have to also think about not only finishing your season, but the next aircraft, or is that all put off? Or how does the transition happen in the Blues? Uh, well, um, they uh, we had to pick an airplane. Uh, everybody had uh, some experience in other airplanes. Uh, they I, I flew had flown the Crusader, so uh, uh, they sent me over to fly the A7, which is a Ling, Ling Temco airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent me over to the Cecil. And once again, it's just like with the Phantom. I uh, showed up on Friday. We went to happy hour that evening to get to know each other a little bit. And we, they gave me some books. And Saturday, we uh, uh, went, went over some stuff on Saturday. And we did a little bit on Sunday. Monday, I just flew. And by, by Wednesday, I had 15 hours. Uh -huh. And I took the airplane up. And I, I didn't do it at altitude. I didn't do it low. But right. I, I set a fairly low altitude for these kids. They were not used to it. But once again, it's like 1,000 feet. And I would do the inverted stuff. And I would do some pulls and turn off, turn off some of the augmentation thing in the airplane. And the airplane would lose 500 feet. Just you're under pull and you turn off a, a stab aug and all. You can't keep it from going down is that because you want to know that it's going to behave well if stuff, something stuff goes bad in an right. air show and i want to know what this is going to do to me in an air show so there was no way that we we're going to be able to do that without some modifications i mean a lot of things can be changed but sure. uh, you can't be having that happen and, and especially when you're that close together you can't okay uh so that, that was the main reason steve lambert had, did something with the a4 he had known the airplane and he uh he flew that uh, Foggy, uh, John Fogg, and Weasel, I think, both uh, did the uh, the T2, actually. We looked at the T2, mm -hmm. the T2B. And um, they wound up choosing the A4, as it turns out, which was the best choice they could have made. Had you flown the A4 in flight school? Like, no, I no? was F11s. Or, and I'm sorry, I had uh, F, uh, F9s. F9s, yeah, okay. But, yeah. Because the when I came around some years later, the TA4, which probably you had some like, of those. On uh, the the team, only but... all I had in the TA4 was in uh, 126. That was... The Blues didn't end up with a. Uh, we did later. Yeah, we okay, got a, sure. we got a TA4 for number seven. We only okay. had one. Right. Really. One. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're now in. So at what point do they say okay the A4? And then what do you do? Do you go as a squadron and go together or? What uh, yes, happens? we went to uh, went to Lemoore and transitioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, Five days again or whatever? No, this was a little <laughs> bit longer. That, you know, yeah. you, you can't talk the rag into that. But yeah. 
when we were running it, we could. Um, I I think I only had f- five, four or five hops, so five hops maybe. Uh, some inter- interesting things there. I went out yeah. on one hop and uh, one of my solos. I got to go in a solo. Uh, it was a T, but it was a solo. And uh, went out, flopped it upside down, and all of a sudden the seat went clank <laughs> and fell to the canopy. It wasn't pinned in. Oh, geez. And so I rolled right right side up, and now it's all cockeyed. Mm. Uh, sure, so he went I, back and landed uh, after yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, we well, went back and landed, and uh, she says, yeah, I might want to bolt this thing down a little bit tighter. This is, I don't think this is right. <laughs> yeah. That canopy, I want to say, had a big metal bar in yeah, the middle, yeah, and you it couldn't did. go through yeah. it. No. Uh, no, I was supposed to leave. Yeah, that, that one you couldn't. Yeah. Uh, so I was, well, I was just concerned could it had come off, and I didn't know what was attached <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be. Um, yeah. But we, uh, we, they went on solo solos so we went out and i was able to fart around and fly upside down and do all that stuff out, out uh in the mountains out there hmm. and, uh, do do some low low there was some, had some areas out there found Fal- was not that far away and, right uh so we had areas that we could fly low so yeah we messed around with that a little bit okay but it wasn't a lot i mean it wasn't a full rag syllabus we didn't get those they didn't figure we needed it and between the end of i guess it was at the 74 show season and Three in the beginning of '74, you're completely a whole different animal now. Uh, yes, it's completely. Well, we commissioned uh, the squad, uh, the Blues as a squadron was one thing we did there. Oh. So now we had a commanding officer who it's post command, and that's when Tony Les came in. He he had a command of an, uh, an A7. Squadron. Was that related to the A4 or just? No, it was related to the fact that we needed some adult leadership. They okay. figured right. uh, to back up the uh, the F4 thing too. You know that. Um, we started with uh, seven, I think, uh, F4s, and uh, we crashed three in winter training. We lost one at Lake Lake uh, Charles, Louisiana, and then we lost uh, two more people in uh, or three people in two airplanes in Lake Kirst. So we lost uh-huh. an entire team. I was the only guy on the team that didn't lose an airplane. The number of crashes you just intimated was that because the jet was difficult to fly, or was it mechanical, or some combination? I'm guessing, but what? That seems like a very high rate. It, it's very high rate. Uh, yeah. It it was a, a more difficult airplane to fly, it, it, over over others that they've done in that environment. Okay. Uh, we had some personality issues on the team mm-hmm. that I really can't don't want to go into. Understood. Um, there were going to be some changes um, the next year, and. Um, Murph, one of the kids that was killed, was a very high-strung kind of guy. He was the slot pilot that year, mm. and uh, didn't get along with uh, one of the other, one or two of the other people. And uh, I mean, we had some internal issues. Okay. And uh, Skip, uh, the leader, was handling it, and I'd already been approached. I wasn't going to be a solo the next year. I was going to be in the diamond because there were some changes going to be made. Okay. And he needed some stability in the diamond. All right. And I wasn't happy about that because no. <laughs> discovered we discussed why. Uh, I rather, yes, I wanted, right. wanted to be a star, not a drone. So, when you were done with that, right? Again, on episode fifty, we talked about you went and did some other things for a while after the Navy. Did they let you out from the Blues, or or did you do your two years and go somewhere else? No, or? we uh, well, we got we transitioned to start with, right. and uh, then got into the A four, right. and uh, and then we made through that that whole season without any problems at all. That's I good. Mean, uh, uh, and uh, I'll be perfectly uh, bl- uh, blunt and honest. I was a basket case, keeping everybody alive. I just, hmm. uh, I had lived through what had happened in the war. We lost some folks. And then uh, living through that stuff with six airplanes and three people. And uh, actually, we lost four because Don Bentley got hurt in the first the three plane thing. And he, he uh-huh. had to leave and they brought, that's why Skip came back. Okay. Um, I, I needed a break. So I got out uh, of Navy. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to get what they call some CADO, Contingency Active Duty Orders. That means they, if you want to come back in within 18 months, they have to let you in. Okay. Uh, so I wanted that to start with just in, in case I, I changed my mind. And uh, and I got out and I had a good friend that I'd met that was on the on the golf tour, a guy named Jim Colbert. Uh, mm-hmm. We wound up being fast friends. And he said, hey, you want to come out? You can come caddy for me if you want. I mean, I can get you a job at a driving range or something. That's pretty easy. <laughs> but I think you might enjoy that. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the best thing that could have happened. I, I, moving from a, a place of uh, uh, some notoriety where you, um, 
you actually have some celebrity uh, that goes along with wh what you've done and who you've known. It's minor, I understand that, but but it was still there. Uh, one of the things we fought is not to read our own press, you know, because that's not who we are, you know, yeah. uh, in, in, in real life. And to going out where I wasn't allowed in the clubhouse and I wasn't allowed to walk on the putting greens and I, things like that. It was it was uh, not a shock, but it's something that really... Hmm. It, it, it was sobering, and it was something that was uh, not needed, I don't think, but it, it was the right thing to happen to me at hmm. the time. Okay. And Jimmy was great about it. He paid for everything, plus I got a percentage of his winnings and, and a, and a, and a wow. flat fee. That sounds really cool if you <laughs> made some money. But uh, I figured if I stayed out there, I, I think, let, let's put it in perspective. Uh, I we drove the best cars. I had a Pantera, so on the West Coast, we took my uh -huh. car. He had a, a Jensen Interceptor, so we drove his car on the East Coast. Uh, one of it, his partner at the, uh, at the uh, Pebble was a guy, Shell Cavalli. Shell owned a Jensen Motor Company. So we had a Jensen Interceptors, and, and he uh, also in, imported all Rolls Royce west of the Mississippi. So we had cars and beautiful hotels and stuff. In the six or uh, four months I was out there, I think I made $38. <laughs> so... Just, just to put it in perspective, so I figured yeah. I needed to do something else. Probably. Now, what year is this? This is 1975. 1975. Okay. Now, tell me if it's changed, because, again, I can only draw a parallel to Top Gun. But when you go through Top Gun now, and I went through in 2000, when you're done, you have a Greemane, as it's called. You agree to remain to do a training officer tour in the fleet. Now, as we'll get to with your story, with Blue Angels, you also are highly trained. There's a lot of investment in you. I'm surprised you were able to leave from the team. Is that still the case? Do you know? Yeah, there's no green mate. Really? Yeah. Okay. But you have a, had, but have, uh, a very special skill set that is in high demand. And as we all know in showbiz, the show must go on. So a couple of years later, what happened? Well, they uh, had a, a, a solo pilot that uh, thought he was better than he was. And uh, had been in a little bit of trouble. Uh, discipline wise on some stuff on the team and he uh, they, they were down an airplane or uh, the lead solo was ill I think it was he flew the airplane down uh, from Point Magoo they came to Miramar uh, he was going to do a single solo a single solo shows a little different in it uh, like a knife edge is just a longer knife edge and inverted is just straight inverted uh, when you do the, uh, the rolls it's supposed to be three rolls the horizontal rolls is what we used to do even just did them, you know, just as a single solo. Okay. He tried to do five. Uh, and it, completely against what he was supposed to do. And uh, I was standing next to Jack Eckle, who was had been selected to the team. I was in the rag getting ready to go to VF-213, actually, and uh, uh, going to the boat on Monday uh, for the CQ, and then I was supposed to report to the squadron. And in the squadron was... Vance Parker, the guy that was my opposing solo in '74, he and I were both going to be department heads in this squadron at the same time. We were, it was, it was heaven. It was going to be so much fun. And the seal was uh, Terry Applegate, and then, then you had uh, Hawk. Um, Monroe Smith was the uh, was oh, the yeah. XO. And mm -hmm. These are just really, really good good people, really good folks. So I was really looking forward to it. standing next to Jack, and we were watching it. He started the three rolls, um, and he started the fourth, and I and I kind of caught, and I caught my breath. Uh, but he finished it, so, okay. And then he started the fifth roll, and he's probably only about 75 feet when he started it and a little nose down. And I said out loud, he's dead. And he got the wings around and underneath him and hit the ground. And a uh, big fireball and explosion. And, uh, testament to the lady that made our flight suits, Mrs. Mrs. Hall. And, uh, he was still in his flight suit, but not a bone was unbroken. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, Big fireball, and I got it put out pretty quick. But uh, yeah. they uh, the next day they asked me to if I would go back. Okay, but I, so there's a detail here I didn't realize. You were already back. Did you use that Cato thing you said? Or oh, did... I'd already come back in the service. Yeah. Oh, I'd come oh, back I'm... in the service, and I made the last F8 cruise. Yeah. That, I oh, you'd up. already done a deployment at that point. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd come right. back and I made so the you... last for risk in the end. So you went and played golf and made thirty eight dollars for a little while. That's right. Yeah. And then you decided to I, I, maybe yeah. I guess yeah. No, that's my for some fault. reason yeah. I thought they called you like out of the. Civilian. Oh no no no. I, I, right. I asked to go back. So you went and goofed around. You decided yeah. okay, the grass was pretty green over there. So yeah. you had come back, done another deployment. The last oh I didn't know that. Yeah, I made the last F eight uh, deployment. Matter of fact, uh, funny story. I I was uh, uh, the last day of the cruise. Uh, the last. Uh, um, 
arrestments we had, I was flying, uh, and I had my wingman and uh, the CO of the other squadron, uh, Jack, and I can't think of his last name. I feel bad about that now. But he was v- 194's CO, and I was in VF-191, which was the old Blue Angel squadron, which uh-huh. is another thing that was really kind of cool. Uh, and when we came back into land, it was the last ar- arrival, and we came in. Everybody got aboard. My F- I, I boltered, un- unfortunately, <laughs> and my uh, uh, my wingman got aboard. Uh, uh, Jack Bolter, the CEO of the other squadron, and his wingman got aboard. So there's only two airplanes left, and m- myself and Jack. And I came around and boltered again. <laughs> and uh, Jack came around and boltered again. And on, when I hit the, uh, the 180, the CEO of the boat came up. It says, Turkey, land it. <laughs> yes, sir. In other words, boltered. Yeah, bol- I, he, we whoops. understand. So we came around and I landed, then Jack landed right behind me. <laughs> and he got the last F-8 landing on a carrier. I got the last F-8 uh, landing in VF-191. So. Okay. Well, the last carrier landing of the last of the gunfighters. Gun right. okay. On the last of the 27 Charlies. That uh, was, uh, oh, wow. That All was right. the Riskany, and they, yeah. they decommissioned the Riskany, and the squadron went to Phantoms. All right, so catching back up to where we were, now you have orders in hand to be a department head in this newfangled F-14 thing with its weird wings, right? Uh, and then there's a mishap, and you have special skills, but you were a little more removed. Was there no one else? I mean, why well, Why Vance, already, Vance Parker, who was my opposing solo, had already been called back. Okay. Uh, one time, uh, I think it was Niall Kraft was killed, and he, he came back in and flew his number six uh, f- for Denny Sapp. Well, then he had gotten out and he was flying for another airline and I was the only one left in the Navy. Okay. So. And at that point, I mean, right, we all saw in Top Gun Maverick the call to orders. Uh, you, you probably don't have much say in that. I mean, right? Again, oh, show I'd, must go on. Oh, I, I, uh, I had no problem going back. Okay. No, because that, you're part of that group oh, and yeah. you're not going to let the team down. No, right? that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. And plus, it, it was going to be fun anyway. And, uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I knew it was not going to be the best thing for my career, I didn't think, but... Uh, didn't matter much. Did it come back quickly, or was it some? Oh no, it came back right away. Yeah. Now they had some new maneuvers. Now, oh. Now there was a maneuver that the tuck over break is, is one that Vance and I started. Uh, we needed to both be going the same way, something different than, than just a fan break coming into Atlanta. We were going to do a Delta uh, landing, and so we had to come into uh, some weird break and then join up and come in and do a Delta <laughs> landing. We didn't do that many Delta landings in, uh, uh, at that time, and so. Uh, uh, we came up with, well, let's try this. So we practiced it a couple of times uh, the week before, and it looked pretty good. Uh, and, it, and it since then really got made b- much better by the teams. You can't even see it's two airplanes when they mm-hmm. come in. Mm-hmm. It's, it's beautiful. When we did, you could kind of see it, but then when you break, <laughs> you see it's two and fan, they come back around. It's really yeah. kind of cool maneuver. Oh, they put it on a good show. So um, uh, they had they had made that better. They did uh, uh, the outside half Cuban 8. They did a, a – you do it – Inverted, in other mm. words, you'd pass inverted, mm-hmm. or you'd, you'd pass and then you flip inverted, go, and then you'd push up for the opposing half Cuban eight, but you pushed over the top. That was, I, I'd never done that before. Okay. Uh, they had the double farvel now, which is, that, that's where the two guys are inverted instead of or the, just the boss being inverted. Uh, not, not much else in the solo world. I think I don't think there was anything else. Uh, but the funny thing about the, uh, the inverted uh, half Cuban eight, f- first time you do it, you know, you start this way, and I came up 90, 90 degrees off. Where are you? He says, well, look at your left wing. And he's, oh, this isn't good. So I tried to, the next time it was a little bit. He says, when you start up, you got to just, whatever the gyro is, lock it. You're going to get some precession. And I hadn't even really thought about that because I was using the gyro and holding it there thinking it was work. It didn't work that well. And uh, and the next, wherever it was, I just locked it there, like two degrees right, and, and it came over. So it was easier. But the first two or three times, it was kind of exciting for a while, trying to figure out where I was. Yeah. So they call you in for that season, but in the meantime, they're grooming the next folks to sort of let you off the hook? Uh, f- oh, for the next year, you mean? Or, yeah, uh, well, they're right. So they bring you in because yeah. they need someone with your skills, and yeah. you trained up pretty quickly. Yeah. And then that's no, understood just, to be a one-year type of deal, and then... Uh, oh, yeah. It was just for the one year. Jim Ross was going to be the uh, lead solo. The whole idea is to train Jungle. His right. call center was Jungle. Jungle. Okay. Right. Uh, and uh, he was phenomenal. I mean, right. I was blessed. I had two of the best pilots that I've ever imagined being my opposing solos ask them to do something they did it uh and you uh, training was just cake they just they did what they were supposed to and, and they did it smartly okay there's there have been some that do, do some crazy stuff but uh jungle and 
Jungle could do some crazy stuff, but it was always safe and fun, funny when he'd, he'd do it. He just he had a great sense of humor. All right. Was there still an F-14 department head job waiting for you after that? Yeah, when I finished there, uh, I got sent to VF-1. Okay. I wanted to be an ops in, in, okay. in VF-1. So you've flown the F-8, the F-4, the A-4, the F-14. I'm sure I'm missing a few well, more. Well, the A-7. The, uh, A-7, that's yeah, right. And the uh, and then I've, I've, I've got some time in the F-100 in Vietnam. That's right. And, and, uh, Talked about and, that on episode 50. And then, uh, of course, in the RAG, I had uh, T-2AB and uh, the, uh, the F-9. Wow. Single seat and two seat <laughs> in, in the F-9. Okay. Uh, I don't think I, I've got, you know, some uh, sp- not spad, but uh, the T twenty eight time I was in oh, the LSO. Wow. We'd take that out to San Clemente. No so, kidding. Yeah. So oh. I got some time in that thing, and uh, we used to have a um, uh, saber liner in the rag. And that's how they put the put us in the back to learn how to do radar stuff in the back of the thing, mm-hmm. and and uh, they would put them in a seat in the right seat uh, up front, uh, and with your head in the boot. And then you had to have somebody to make get them right side up again. So I would I'd fly on the left seat for that. Huh. And uh, and I've had the T thirty T thirty nine upside down or T thirty was that that was saber liners the T thirty nine yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. had it upside down more times than I he had it upside down <laughs> I got it right side up. Well, you were comfortable being upside down, just not in that airplane. That's huh? correct. That's All correct. right, good. Well, I tell you what, you availed to me a website that we'll leave a link for our viewers to see. But on there are some videos and photos, and I grabbed a couple. So let's let's take a look at some of these, Jerry. All right, so this first shot here, you know, I hate to say it, I couldn't even pick you out of this. <laughs> oh, I, I was a little bit younger then. <laughs> uh, that's me second from the left. Okay, so six demo pilots, a narrator, and then who's the eighth? Event coordinator. Event coordinator, okay. All right. Now, again, right, the show probably looks a little bit like it used to, but, uh, you know, for the solos going by each other. One thing I wanted to ask on one of these pictures, I could just ask it here. I think you mentioned this, again, on episode 50. You could take your crew chiefs or or plane captains, as we would call them, to the different shows. But during the show, was it verboten to put anybody in the backseat? Very seldom did anybody fly in the backseat in the show. I think uh, Harry Gann may have been able to he was a civilian photographer okay. and, and but not very often okay part of the reason that we didn't want in the show is because uh the ejection sequence is back seat front seat and we were able to change that uh only in our airplanes where it was uh whoever got there first went oh, wow. first and because you didn't you know to, to say the back seater and, and let the pilot go in for that half second right. matters at, at that times. altitude and speed and the way, what we're doing that's yeah. exactly right okay and then uh so yeah, I mean, so again, right? Right now, if you go to the Blue Angels, you'll see in their Super Hornets, they mm-hmm. do passes somewhere. And I don't know all the names. I'm sure you do. Um, but a lot of these have been part of the routine for a long time. Oh, yeah. Th- this was the back-to-back, and I I don't know when it's, this one started. I really don't. This could have started in the F-11. Tell me about these missiles I see on number six. Uh, they are full of dye. Really? That, that's where they held the dye for the uh, huh. uh, Sparrow missiles. That's where they held the dye that we used to have colored uh uh, smoke. Okay. Uh, that wasn't really smoke. It was metered fuel. Uh, <laughs> but we kept that to ourselves for a long time. Yeah. Now, on this one, we have a video, and you talked about the fact that there were quite a few mishaps uh, back then. Wh- where are we, and what are we seeing you know, here? You're pointing at me right there. That, okay. That, oh, yeah, that's you. I, I, that's I'm five. Number okay. six. No, that's number no, six. six. Oh. I'm number six on, on the team in, in Phantoms. Okay. That's Steve Lambert. Okay. And what had happened is, well, you'll see it here. Did he have an aircraft problem, or did it depart? Almost, it looked like. Well, something distracted him, and he didn't have the power back up. So he basically got slower and slower. I just fly formation. I don't check anything. I mean, you can see and fairly close. Not as close as some of the others, because for optics, you have to get out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and plus, there's, there's more, um, there is some downwashing stuff in that maneuver because of the flaps and, and, and the stuff that goes down. The flaps weren't down, but the, uh, there's other thing, the gear, and it's kind of, mm-hmm. it's more turbulent than normal. Um, so I'm just flying formation, and Steve says, I've got to roll out. And, and, I, and I said, clear, and I just said it's reactive. And I put the stick over, went to full, uh, full power, and nothing happened. I didn't move. I looked down, and I was 165 knots uh, uh, with no flaps in the gear down, in mm-hmm. the hook down. Mm-hmm. And, and so, I mean, I'm just hanging on, on a, a wing and a prayer right there. And eventually you can see it goes full smoke. It gets real black at the back, and then it gets clear because that's when I'm in burner, and, and the smoke stops in burner. And I'm just trying to get out of the way. And finally, by the time I rolled up, that's what I saw. 
never saw the shoot. You can see that white, I believe, is his shoot. What had happened is he came in and hit the ground and bounced in the air, and he said, okay, I'm okay. But then when he started to come down again, he saw he wasn't going to stay in the air, so he ejected. And what happened is the shoot came out, and it kind of goes, Burp, and he went right in. And by the time I got around where I could see anything and the diamond could, I looked, was nothing. You could, never saw a shoot. We thought he was dead. We had no idea he made it. Wow. So we joined up and uh, uh, what are we going to do? Well, we'll do a missing man and land. The show's over. Uh, so we did. We went up and did a, came in and uh, joined up in, in a, um, a little V, and, uh, or big V, and uh, uh, came by and I did the missing man. She had him crying like a baby. He's like a brother. Yeah. Tears running down while I'm doing this stuff. It just really was disappointing. We landed, went to the, uh, we were in the line, we all got out, you know, and uh, we're talking, and all of a sudden, what are we gonna do now? And then we look over there, and here walking out of the swamp is Steve carrying his parachute. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> nice missing man for me. Yeah, <laughs> look good. But I'm back. Oh, dear. Yeah, it was amazing. What happens? He hit the ground, he thought he was gonna make it after that, but wow. then when it went in the second time, he knew he couldn't. That, that says something about F-4 pilots thinking you can survive a, uh, a yeah. ground strike. Yeah, well, there's thing. a lot of airplane there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. The ground is licking its uh, bruises after it gets hit by an F-4. All right. Well, you talked about the smoke. I mean, this was a smoky airplane, but not the kind of smoke you want. In no, that's black smoke. Right? This is the this is the real smoke. Okay. This, this is uh, oil. It's a 10-grade 10, 10 oil uh, mm -hmm. that they eject into the uh, exhaust, and that's what causes the smoke. Causes the smoke. Yeah. And the fact that there were smoky motors in the first place didn't affect the no, smoke that you no. put they in the performance? They actually cured that later, uh, and uh -huh. I don't know if we ever got the cure or not. You okay. could tell I had a lot of smoke coming out of mine. So Which I ones do you hear? That's me on, on the right. On the or right. left. I'm, I'm sorry, number left. six. Okay, I'm number, number six. six. I was a wingman. Uh, I didn't lead anything on, on, uh, in 73. In, in Phantoms. Okay. This right. is the same thing out in the desert. That's me on the left. Okay. The one. And you said earlier, and I think that previous picture was, you took this tour on the road to Europe. Yeah, we went... Uh, I uh, went to uh, Spain first. We went to uh, um, Madrid. Then we went to uh, Zaragoza. Uh, didn't fly there for some reason. We had weather problems there. Uh. But we flew up there and met the people and did all the junk and then came mm -hmm. back. Then we uh, came back to Madrid, uh, flew a uh, show for the Juan Carlos, who's the king of Spain. He was the crown prince at the time. Um, and then we went down to uh, Rota and flew an air show down there. And I don't think we had anything else in Spain. Okay. And did you... Obviously, fly the jets over and with oh yeah, the we flew the airplanes over. We took off out of Pensacola and tanked Air Force tankers going across. All right, uh, tanked about every ten minutes with the Air Force. You got have enough <laughs> gas to get somewhere basically. So it was uh, yeah. Uh, and we landed in in Rota was the first place we landed, and then we went to England, uh, wow. flew uh, uh, Upper Hayford, Bentwaters, Hucknall. Uh, met the sh sheriff at Nottingham, who was a woman. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was kind of strange. Uh, how far, how long, rather, was the flight from Pensacola to Rota? Do you remember? Uh, well, we didn't go, uh, we went to uh, Madrid, not to Rota. We, oh, okay. we flew in uh, Madrid. It was about seven hours, eight hours, maybe. Oh, wow, okay. I, it's been, I can't remember. Oh, that's not too bad. Did you have someone with you, or was Yeah, it? yeah, my crew chief was Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, I thought at first looking at this, it was a takeoff, but I think the- No, it's a landing. Right. The caption says, I think, Delta landing, something like that. Why on earth would you want to land six airplanes at once? Because you can? <laughs> yeah. He had, in the Phantom, you had to have, a, I think, a 300-foot wide runway to do it. Yeah, okay. so we don't, didn't do it very often. No. And uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. I think uh, we did it at uh, in Atlanta and someplace else, but I can't remember where else we did it. We didn't do very many, though. But five and six are probably the first to touch down. Do you yeah, have to, the like, whole back add, row. Do you have to add a little power to not slow down Oh, yeah, you, still, you fly formation because you can see how high the boss is. Right. I mean, uh, you're flying formation until he's down. and Even he with your wheels power. on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was exciting. I'll bet. The uh, takeoff was exciting, too. Uh-huh. All right, well, then we give up the Phantom for this little guy. Yeah. and uh, well, We didn't give it up. We ran out of him. <laughs> Semantics, but yeah. well, okay, well put. Um, and uh, I think I've got a question coming up later, so we can uh, save it for that. But the um, right, you had to do some modifications to the slats. Yeah, we bolted the slats in this thing. This this had uh, uh, the bigger engine in it. Okay, right? this had the big A4 engine, but not uh, afterburning. No, no, okay. I had no afterburner, but it had better than one one, one thrust to weight at, wow. at thirteen hundred pounds of gas. Okay, but it's still uh, with tremendous power. Actually, okay. it was a much more powerful thrust to weight than the Phantom. And oh. the roll rate was almost half again as much. This is 720, and the Phantom was 420. Okay. 
One thing I've always wondered, Jerry, the uh, A4 came in different variants with just, if nothing else, the, the uh, probe. Mm -hmm. Did you always have the one with a bend in it? Or yes. Did, the fit. So they wouldn't want any that had the straight probe, right? Or no, was that well, later? No, that, that's the Fox. This is the Fox. Drive. Okay. So the Fox all had that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I just wondered if, if one did come along and uh, as a replacement and it no. had the wrong probe, if they would replace it or something. They would have fixed it. They'd have done this. <laughs> yeah. All it's right. just plumbing. Yeah. All right. And uh, as far as checkpoints or whatever you would call them flying off of other folks. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that seems like a big deal. I'm guessing when you do it as a professional blue angel, you just figure out what the new points are and yeah. that's it. You just yeah. do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's but, basically said. But now it's one engine, not two, right? Yeah. Did, did you ever find yourself in your demo walking the two throttles in a Phantom? Oh yeah. All the time. Okay. Uh, so, but, so, but not, not big. It, it right. was little. I mean, we, we, we they didn't, didn't take them together really except for takeoff. Okay. But in an A4 now you don't have that anymore, no. but you just mm -hmm. adapt. Yeah. Yeah, you don't even think about it. Right. Honestly, I never did think about it. The air, airplane was uh, it was a little bit lighter on the on the wings, uh, and uh, this had a problem with the uh, the pull. Um, we actually had to, uh, two trims. We trimmed two things. You trim the stab in this thing, and, mm -hmm. and uh, then you, you uh, uh, and we had to put uh, downsprings on it. And boy, they they fought it at uh, Mickey D. Uh, the, the Douglas guys, basically, because uh -huh. it took them a long time. The airplane was squirrely. It was it was unstable airplane. Mm. They finally got it going, and they got it by mistake. He admitted that to me over a beer one night. Uh, the engineer did. <laughs> and um, But we had to have pull on the airplane. Now, the Phantom was 28 pounds just to pull it off the, off the stop. Mm. This one uh, was only like 17 or so, but we finally got something where it was consistent anyway. And is that because it's easier to be precise when you have some You don't have to push. You right? never have to you just push. hold you a certain you amount. hold it and you relax it. Right. So you have control over it all the time. Okay. Now, there was a time where this arm was that big. And it was just from the, – the Phantom did that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's isometric um, to the max there just when you start flying the airplane. Turkey, I, I have to ask you something I've always wondered. I don't know about you. There are certain – Things I either read or see or experience in my life that I remember. I can't remember important things, but I remember this. I remember reading when I was a young person about, it might have been the Thunderbirds, but the point is the same, that one of the Delta pilots at the top of a loop in practice suddenly remembered that on the way home, his wife wanted him to stop at the commissary and pick up like something. And a moment ago, you said you didn't even think about it. I, to me, at, as a young man at that time, that was just mind-blowing like how on earth could you think about anything else in that moment but i guess did you ever have a situation like that i mean did you get so proficient where you weren't necessarily in the moment but you were but you still had enough brain bites to think about other things or well everybody has little uh moments i did a touch and go on a dirty roll and i think i had a brain fart in that one yeah uh, i'm pretty at the top i just was trying to make it look better and kind of drove it till i got two nose down and uh I pulled for all I was worth in full power, and I still touched down on a cross taxiway. Wow. Uh, very wide, very short runway, um, and bounced into the air. Uh, we had some good pictures, but I sent them to one, uh, two of them to a, a friend who was going to paint it, and I never got them back. So, <laughs> But you can, uh, you can sure see it. Yeah. And it wow. was, uh, it was, uh, okay. it got my attention. That was probably the yeah. only time. So, all right, so hold on. I have to rejigger what I'm thinking here because the way I interpreted it at the time was he was so proficient, he was allowing himself to think about what he needed to do after practice. But I think what I hear you saying is if you let your brain go think about going to the commissary afterwards, you need to snap back to the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, the other things can happen. It depends on where at the top of a loop, who cares? That's the highest you're going to be in the air show. Right. So you're the safest you're going to be. Uh, <laughs> but, but not a really good time to be thinking about that sort of stuff. Okay, with you. all right. All right. Well, I'll tell you what there, uh, Turkey, I've got some listener questions I want to put to you, if I may. Mm -hmm. These are folks that support the show on a site called Patreon. And so one of the perks is they get to find out about interviews like this one and pose questions to me that I can put to you. So the first one is from Al Jackson, who alleges that a Vince Dunnelly once accidentally broke the sound barrier during a Blue Angels performance in an F4. And so... Al wants to know, did you often find the plane getting away from you in terms of airspeed? How much focus 
did you have to dedicate to staying under the number? So, but let's start with the first part. Uh, I didn't know uh, Vince Dunnelly, but I don't know all the blues anyway. Uh, any any uh, truth to that story? Well, the the story is true. Okay. Uh, and, and just uh, to defend Vince, is Vince Dunnelly. Uh, he was the ops officer uh, when they transitioned to the F-4. Okay. And it was, I believe, in Ontario, but it was over, I think it was Lake Ontario going in, and he just was a little late and on the cross and just sort of bumped the number and... <laughs> Broke about a million dollars worth of windows and uh, really? a whole bunch of windows. Let's put it that yeah, yeah. Like that, in town. Okay, uh, it happened. Yes, it did. All right. Now, as far as uh, us, we didn't have anything really in the show. I came uh, close a couple of times, but I, uh, as a solo, we were the only ones that really were in a position where that could happen. The slow, fast. Uh, one time in the Paris Air Show, I, I, I came close, but I didn't didn't bump the number. <laughs> I did get kicked out of the show, but uh, for that's other a reasons. different story. Yeah, that's a different. Yeah, story. that's right. Um, the uh, the team now has a bigger problem with that because this airplane can go through the number, and they have a couple of maneuvers that are really close. They they try to go about nine six or so, so that they get the the shock wave on the uh, airplane mm-hmm. uh, in a couple of airplanes. Um, they they they. Actually, did tap the number a couple of times uh, last year, I believe it was, wow. and, and in training, until they f- finally figured out a way to keep that from happening. All right. Uh, but as far as the fa- Phantom, no, we didn't really have anything that would really uh, do it, uh, uh, put you in a position where you could bump yeah. the number that much. And, and why is that a big deal, right, at an air show here in the States or, or anywhere, for that matter, over land? It breaks windows. It really it, does break right. windows. So. Uh, and that, that's the main reason. Okay. Um, they They've they've kind of changed the show a little bit where there's some um, they scare some people at times because they thump the crowd a few times. Right. But, uh, that's just a term we use when we, we kind of sneak up on them from mm-hmm. behind. Uh, but but it's straight and level. It's not acrobatic at all. Right. Uh, um, and it's kind it's kind of fun to see that shock wave anyway too. On on the right day, I mean, it's a whole cone around the airplane. Oh gosh, yeah. There's great pictures oh. from like Seattle or or uh, San Francisco. Oh yeah. Where <laughs> with all that saltwater air. Uh, it's really uh, neat. Yep. It's neat to see. All right. So yeah, right. If you're in the diamond, you're following the boss. The boss isn't anywhere close. But if you're a little late, uh, then on the they, cross is the only time they really have. Uh, because you're trying to make that happen at a specific yes, spot. Yes, you, you've got you. If you're a little late, you're going to keep the speed up to make up that time so that you get to the uh, the the cross point at the same time. Gotcha. All right, Scott Kelly wants to know what happens if you bump another plane during the show. Hopefully, you're still airborne. Uh, depends on how hard you bump. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, I was bumped in the fleet, but I was never bumped in an air show. Really? Uh, and we, we flew, flew pretty close together, too, even as a solo. Was that understood in the brief, let's say, or just in standard operating procedure as you knock it off if that happened? Or? No, not really. Yeah. It, de- it depends on what happens. It just doesn't happen. I mean, okay. that's the thing. We, we don't, I don't remember ever really even um, coming up with a contingency for that. Uh, everything was designed such that you didn't bump. Right. Uh, of course. Uh, the Phantom was a little bit uh, flimsier with that, so if you did bump, it had... Um, just because of the angles and stuff, and mm-hmm. it was an older airplane. Uh, well, not older than the A4, but the A4 was just a solid wing, uh, no wing fold to it, mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, I always thought of the F4 as kind of a dump truck. You're saying it's a little fragile in some uh, ways? Yeah, you look at it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, in certain ways they are. Okay. Uh, I mean, yes. Okay. Let's, let's leave it at that. Leave it at that. Yeah, it at that. So, yeah. All right. Jevin says, during your time with the Blues, did you ever see any maneuver created that eventually developed a combat application? No, most of our maneuvers come from combat. Isn't that part of the show? The narrator yeah. will tell you. Right? Yeah, a lot of those things are are maneuvers that are used uh, by fleet pilots. We didn't. Uh, I mean, there, you don't do outside half Cuban eights and stuff in the fleet that much. But in a fight, you may need to. Mm-hmm. I mean, you may need to use negative G uh, to throw the guy off because he can't follow you. He'd have to roll. As soon as he rolls, now you can pull real hard back into him and you can get get him out of sync so that he might fly out in front of you or get in a position where you can maneuver okay. behind him. Uh, other than that, I honestly don't know of any that uh, developed, that we did that went to the fleet. Uh, 
if you did some of our things in the fleet, you probably wouldn't be flying anymore. Uh, <laughs> ours were yeah. down a little bit lower. Maybe Jevin had watched The Rock. You remember that movie? Oh, where, yeah. Where uh, yeah. the Blue Angels from Fleet Week all of a sudden turned into the strikers attacking uh, yeah, Alcatraz. Yeah, so you be. see the Delta going down under the bridge. And yeah. <laughs> that might be what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but good stuff. All right. Tom Oates says, what precipitated the change of aircraft? And you said earlier... You Pretty much ran out of F-4s. Pretty much ran out of them. We lost three in winter training. We lost one halfway through the season, and then we lost two more in uh, at Lakers. And so were Blue Angels not a big enough priority? I mean, there was a war going on, right? So that, Yeah, and that, that really is it. Uh, if we're going to – the Blue Angels almost went away. I mean, it, the only thing that saved us was Admiral Zumwalt. Uh, there was a, a big move because of – the loss of that many airplanes and the Thunderbirds lost a couple, a few too. I don't know the exact numbers, but they lost some F4s the same year we did, uh, running off runways and crashing. And, uh, um, it was not a good year for the Phantom. Yeah. Uh, and with the war going on, uh, th- those assets were required, uh, in the combat sure. zone. We, uh, yeah. uh, even if it's just for parts, uh, you hmm. know, you, you can't keep crashing them. Right. But you still um, have to recruit the next generation of young people. That's what that's what saved us. It <laughs> yeah. was the recruiting okay. command. And Admiral Zumwalt made that decision and says, you know, we have got to have the, the recruiting arm uh, in place. And they, they mean too much. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've been at this show a long time, and I thought I was the only one who went to an air show when he was eight years old and yeah, decided that's what he wanted to do. I've met a lot, yeah, and I hear from them too. So I was really fortunate too because uh, after uh, we were on the stand down transitioning to the A four, I went over to New Orleans. Uh, Corky Fornoff was an old friend of mine, and he, he used to play the Bearcats in, in the air shows. Oh wow! And we got to be uh, real close. He he was the last civilian that got to fly in one of our airplanes. I got to take him up just before we got rid of him. Huh. And a uh, really, really good guy. Well, while we were there, there was a, a football game. It was an uh, Army, uh, Navy against somebody football game, and Admiral Zumwalt was there in the crowd. And I, I talked to his people and asked if I could just say hello. Mm-hmm. And I sat down and I thanked him. I said, I told him, you know, you saved us. I mean, which is odd for since you're a black shoe. <laughs> but uh, he was the CNO, right? He was the CNO. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, Chief uh, of Naval Operations. Exactly. Okay. And I uh, thanked him very, very much. Says, you you saved us, and, and uh, we're going to do our very, very best for you. Okay. Make sure this doesn't happen again yeah. for a long time. You just made me have the realization suddenly, duh, that the Thunderbirds flew the F-4, and I think it's right, the only airplane that both teams flew it's sa- the same airplane. I think so. It's and it's the only one, they, well, for that matter, but you flew it at the same time. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. We uh, flew with them in the Phantom. I don't know if I did or not. I honestly can't remember. I don't think I did. I did in uh, when A4 and they had uh, uh, the F-16s or, right. or T-38s, I think, they right. had first. And, uh, and, I, and I got to fly with some of the guys later, too. I flew with uh, uh, one of their, their lead solo uh, at Southwest, he was my FO oh, wow. a couple of times. Yeah, <laughs> Hoss uh, Jones. Okay, I, I don't know how much of this you want to talk about. Y- you talked about even between the Blue Angels, the Diamond, and the Solo Pilots having a little fun. What's it like between the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels? I got to think it's <laughs> we, we got we got along very well. Okay, uh, we, we knew uh, we knew the guys fairly well, okay. and we we knew not to overstep our bounds, but we. We gave them a little grief at times. I'm sure it was returned. Yeah. Well, their their show was different. Right. Uh, a lot of ura ura stuff in their show. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it because we've kind of gone that direction since I left uh, as well. But they uh, their walk walk down and all that stuff was kind kind of goofy. And uh, uh, but they still put on a very professional mm-hmm. show. They did some things that when we flew together, we we had uh, honest debriefs, briefs and debriefs where we tell them what we thought they were doing really not real safe or ways they might be able to do some things a little bit better. Yeah. And they listened and yeah. they changed a few things and they had some really, really the solos. We, we got along really well. They only had a single solo when, uh, when I was there uh, the first time and then they went to the dual solo later. Steve Dwally was the guy when I was there in 73. Did both teams normally get invited? How do I put this to the same show? I don't think in my childhood, I ever saw them at the same show. Very seldom are they at the same because show. one of them has to go last and that's, the feature and so <laughs> no we we got together with them because it was planned as as a right. joint get together just as a seminar more than anything oh, wow, just okay. to talk about air shows yeah we'd go to an so they'd come to pensacola and that's that's okay we had a couple there was a there was a big air show they used to do i think at dulles and uh they had both teams there uh, once or twice that was in 72 i think 
And then more recently during COVID, right, there wasn't a lot of air shows happening. So we saw yeah. a lot of photographs of right. the 12 aircraft. Going exactly. Around, just was, just flying around together, which was cool. I it liked, was. I liked yeah. it. Yeah. It, it, it. Just show the flag a little bit. And that All was right. kind of fun to see. Good. All right. Let's see. Ofer Haran wants to know, did the team welcome the change or was there some pushback? Right. Everybody loves their whatever they're currently doing. People don't like change. How was the change? The change for us was good because that meant we were still had a job. Right. We were still in business. Okay. Because we were really close to both teams going away. I wow. mean, it just the expense. The Phantom was very, very uh, expensive to maintain. Uh, it we our, our enlisted group was about 140, I believe it was, and we took it down to 80. Uh, j with the A4. It just it got cut that in half. So it saved a lot of uh, time on the guys, too. It's just a simpler airplane, too. The yeah. Phantom is a much more complicated airplane. Yeah. Uh, we were just really, really tickled to uh, to have a job to to go to in the morning after that, you know, because it, it was really that close. Wow. We had uh, three or four admirals and, and captains and former blues uh, that came as adult leadership while we were going through the transition to make sure we were doing things uh, right and, and, and they could offer help. Not, not so much that they were trying to run things, mm -hmm. they were there as, as moral support as well. So I thought about this earlier because you said the reason you got a job partly was because they wanted a fighter guy, by golly. But then you went and uh, tested the A7. Come on, was it ever really going to be a contender? No. <laughs> Let me think about it. No. <laughs> No, I, okay. I, I'd never been on a cruise with A7s. We had A4s on my ship anyway. Mm. But it, the reason they sent me was because I'd flown Ling airplanes. The F8 was made by Ling Temco Vought. Right. Uh, Vought airplanes, not Ling. But, uh, so it, it was going to be a quicker transition. I'd, I'd be, be able to get a feel for it. But no, it, it did. Even though it, it was a D and it had uh, it was a more powerful airplane, they, they bragged about how clean and fast and all the stuff it was. It, it was like flying a snail. It was not... Okay. It wasn't. But maybe by going and testing it, even though you sounds like knew what the answer would be, you could at least tell everybody, hey, oh, we, yeah. we checked it. Yeah, and, and I found some things that were unsafe. They were going to have to really change some of the, 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 the parts of the airplane that uh, really augmented safety in the airplane. And we couldn't have it uh, for that popping out in the show. Was gonna, there was going to be some payback. <laughs> Somebody's going to get right. hurt. All right. Uh, Niels Hansen says the F-4 and A-4 are dramatically different aircraft. He doesn't have to tell you that, but just to frame his question, how or what did you have to do and how hard was it to transition from a giant, powerful Phantom to the nimble, quick Skyhawk? Well, uh, the Phantom was a pretty quick airplane, too. It's just the, the, uh, the Skyhawk, uh, the A-4 is just very responsive, much more responsive than the uh, Phantom because they, a lot of things are dampened on the Phantom because it could do things faster, but you, you, you can't. Like the modern airplanes, they are built uh, to be unstable. And what keeps them stable are the computers now. Uh, so it's easier to design the airplane because you, if you've got a, uh, an area of flight that's unsafe, you can fix it with the computer having it uh, go against the unsafe part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want the unsafe part. You want that edge that you can do it as long as you can control it. If you can control it and know what the, the consequences are, it gives you uh, an advantage in certain situations of flight, in dogfighting especially. You want to be able to, to fly up your own butt. I mean, you really do. You want to be able to turn so fast and so hard mm -hmm. that uh, the other guy can't keep up with you. That's what you're looking for. Um, a naval aviator... Um, that's, that, that, that flew tactical aircraft. And I, this is parochial, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this to start with. <laughs> okay. Well, I can fly anything. Even at my age right now, if you give, give, put me in an airplane inside of two days, I can fly the airplane. I promise you I can. And I can fly it pretty, pretty well and pretty safely. And I can do it low, and I can do it fast, and I can do it upside down. It's because of the experience that we have. So trans transitioning from the F-8 to the F-4, uh, that was cake. That was really cake because the F-4 was so much more stable than the F-8 was. So, I mean, it was like flying itself. The A-4, after the, after the Phantom, it was just fun. It was fun because you suddenly were in a sports car again because that's what it felt like compared. Mm -hmm. to, and the F-18 and stuff, I can only dream how, how my, uh, that they're yeah. fun. Yeah. But did the lack of an afterburner in the A4, was that ever an issue? Because to me, that's almost like a safety mechanism. 
if you really needed it, maybe? Well, what the afterburner does is give you an, an additional amount of thrust. The right. total amount of thrust you have in the Phantom is in full afterburner. Relative to the A4, the, uh, the A4 is more powerful. The A4 is better than one-to-one -one thrust ratio at 1,300 pounds of gas. Now, for, the, I, for the airplane it's in. Yeah, for the airplane it's already in it right, with, yeah. that, with the engines that we had. Right. Uh, the roll rate was 40% faster than the F4 was. Um, it, it could turn on a dime, give you nine cents change, you know, that old joke. Um, <laughs> it, it was a phenomenal airplane. So as far as the power, uh, power is relative. If you got better than one-to-one, -one, you feel the G. You feel the lateral G mm -hmm. when you threw the power into that thing. You feel it pushed back. It pushed you back harder in the A4 than it did in the Phantom. Mm. Now, I'll, I'll tell a story on the Phantom. We used to do the Delta cleanup loop. We'd come in dirty in the Delta, gear and flaps down. I don't know if we had flaps, but I know we had gear down, the hook down, and we'd come in and, okay, adding the power, burner on now, gear up, and we'd start up into a loop. Right about here, every air show, I'd say, not today, we're not going to make it, and it would power over the top. But it was an uncomfortable feeling, but it was just raw power pushing you over the top. So it was your muscle memory thinking you wouldn't make it, That's but right. the Phantom said, no, I got no, this. I got it. I Hold got my it. beer. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's <laughs> exactly it. And it would push right over the top, and we'd clean up and, and be clean up on the, uh, clean on the back. Or mm. we'd break out of that. I can't remember exactly what we did now, mm. but, but it, was, it was amazing. Well, the A4 would never be even a problem to do. To there was do no that. doubt. There was no doubt. I mean, in raw power, without burner, you still had that power. Sparky says, what airframe mods from a Fleet Bird to the Blues Bird was done on the A4s? And he mentioned slats, tune the engine, seat. I don't know what he means by seat, but remove weight. Um, you did talk about, let's harp on the uh, slats for a moment, because the slats are, I don't know what you call them, but like a gravity type slat. They're out when the jet is just parked, but through certain angles of attack and speeds, the aerodynamic force pushes them up. Yeah, and then cool. over time rails get bent so they don't come out the same and it can cause weirdness, right? Well, that's possible. Uh, we never, well, t to preclude that, we bolted them up. Okay. That's so they why, didn't ever come down in your airplanes. I have had uh, one come out and, and then you release the G and it's stuck out. I've had that happen. That's Wait, a, in a blue? In, no, uh, yeah, in practice. But they were bolted. Before we bolted them. Ah, See, we right. had them before we bolted the things. That's how we learned about some <laughs> yeah. of these things. We thought we were going to bolt them to start with anyway, but I've had that happen. Vance had it happen more than once in, in the rolls and stuff. It, it can happen. Okay. Um, it's mostly speed is what pushed them up. Uh, but you, you, with the right G and what we did, we, we kind of did some funny things in the airplanes uh, at times. And... Uh, uh, so bolting them up removed variability. Yeah, is that yeah. one it, way to consistency. put it? Consistency. You okay. you wouldn't be put in a position where you'd have one down and one up, at at an odd uh, power setting or odd speed, and then not be able to control the airplane. So you had you had to remove some of those okay. those things from it. So to the Sparky's point, obviously they got painted. You had some oh, sort yeah. of uh, smoke system, which we, we talked yeah, a little bit about. Yeah, we put the smoke in it. We had some trouble. It leads into another story. Uh, we had some trouble with the inverted fuel system. Uh, okay. The inverted fuel system in the A4 is just a tank, so maybe about this big, with flapper valves all over it that are spring-loaded uh, <clears throat> to, to be open and then close when you go upside down. They all close up and traps uh, 30 seconds or 60 seconds of fuel in, in this one tank. Mm -hmm. um, Vance and I uh, had fleet airplanes. We were out in, uh, in the training area, which was uh, uh, north, north northwest of uh, El Centro. Um, and I just was doing an inverted flight, just inverted flight. And just about center point, all of a sudden, the engine quit. Now, let me explain something to you. When an engine quits in an airplane and you've got one engine, that is the loudest quiet you will ever hear in your life. So, of course, the first thing, you, you don't think about what to do. You react. I pushed out, pushed up and out, and, and then rolled the thing out. And then just went through the relay procedure, aiming over at the field. I'm already heading back home. And, and, and it, it, the airplane relit. The engine relit. Got it back up to speed. Once again, I was very careful not to talk on the radio because I knew what I was going to sound like. <laughs> so, so we head on, headed on back and just uh, and came back and yeah. just did it straight in. Back yeah, because you don't know what the problem was. have no real right. idea what the problem right. was. And as it turned out, they had two, two or three or four of those flapper valves. The springs had broke, so it went, up, went upside down. They stuck open, so all the gas ran out. So, you know, no gas, no go. Uh, so uh, 
uh, they were able to get that part fixed. Mm -hmm. So we knew now that we had to come up with a different uh, inverted system. So they went back to uh, uh, the engineers at Douglas, and, and they came up with a system that had, as it turns out, um, well, I'll, I'll get to what they did in a second. Now they, they didn't want us to test them, so they brought some TPS guys out. Uh, and there were two of them. Uh, we went up to Palmdale, which is where they did the mod, and then we uh, they flew out over uh, at the Edwards complex, which is just north of Palmdale. Mm -hmm. um, great guys. The TPS guys are great. They wanted to know how we did all this stuff. So I told them and uh, how, how, how we got inverted, how all that stuff. And uh, so, okay, so he went out and flew, and he went up to about 10,000 feet or 15,000 feet, and he rolled over, and the engine quit on him right away. So he, he rolled over right side, got it, got it going. Um, and the reason they went to Edwards, of course, is they got a 400-mile runway up there yeah, you can land right. on. So uh, he got, got, it, got it relit, came back into Palmdale, landed straight in there. So he's coming up uh, to the office or, or the, the ready room thing we've got there, and uh, uh, he's in there. Uh, then the engineers come in with their bow tie and, and their pocket protectors and a slide rule on it, and you think I'm kidding. That's what the guy looked like. <laughs> it's exactly. And he was the guy that designed the fuel system on the original A4, and he's the one that designed this. And he says, well, can we look at this thing? Because I'd never looked at it. It's not my job. He rolled it out, and I said, well, that's the problem. I mean, he, what they did is they put a standpipe through the thing, put baffles in it, just a standpipe with a big balloon, you know, a blunderbuss at the top of the thing. But there's, you roll upside down at zero G, it gets a, it gets a big uh, gulp of, uh, of uh, air and mm. the engine quit. That's why the engine quit. Mm. I said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, they didn't tell me I had to get upside down. They said I had to be upside down. <laughs> so, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't think we'll be needing any more talk today. <laughs> <laughs> so they left, and, and, and the TPS guys are they're shaking their yeah. head, too. But what they wound up with are uh, were pressurized tanks that pressurized it. Okay. They put those things in. And we I, one day we flew all the way from, took off from Pensacola, and as soon as I got a, above 10,000, I just rolled upside down, flew all the way to Mobile, inverted. So <laughs> it wasn't going to quit anymore. So, But but that's the sort of thing we had okay. to go through. With. Yeah. And you don't know that till you start doing it. Until you start doing yeah. it. That's exactly right. Did you do anything with the seats in the A4? Sparky said something about seats. No. Okay. No, they're zero zero sheet seats. Okay. What we had what had to work on was the zero G restraint. Uh -huh. And I, and I gee, I had a picture of that somewhere. That me, me hanging upside down with the zero G restraint testing out in in, Pens in, the, in El Centro in the, mm -hmm. in the, yeah. Okay. What about the gun? Did they take the gun out? Uh, yes, they took the gun out and put a ladder in there. They just had to design a ladder that we could carry with us on it because the A4 had this big old clunky thing they rolled around right. a, a pin that went in the side of the airplane. Well, they took it out and it was you know a, a thing like that. Or folded it up and they put it <laughs> yeah origami ladder, but it worked. Okay, all right. Uh, last question I have is from John Clark. What advantages and disadvantages did each airframe present, and did those traits allow or force a change in maneuvers? I'm guessing there was quite a bit of maneuver change, but let's ask it from this point of view, from the spectator. Who saw it the one year, the show, hopefully one without crashes, and then the next year, which show was more impressive, do you think? I think the A4 was more impressive because it was faster. The A4? A4. Because it, okay. it was faster, it was closer, uh, it was right there. Everything was in front of you. And we tried, our show was like 38 minutes long, 35 minutes long. Okay. Now they're almost an hour. They're 40, 45, 48 minutes, and we did actually more maneuvers uh, then. Mm. Uh, but, but we did everything right there. When we cleared, we went up. And so when, when the Diamond finished their maneuver, we were in right now. It's, uh, they have a little bit more of a gap now. And it's changed over the years. It, it's gone to where they, they did vertical for a while, then they did everything horizontal, and they'd be gone forever, and they'd come back in from horizontal turns. Not, I was never a big fan of that myself. Yeah. They, they do a lot of vertical stuff now, but it's still, it's still a little, little loose. And, but they're working. They're always working on it. They're mm -hmm. always trying to keep it. I always thought the A4 was a better, a better tighter show of, of the two. Okay. And to back up just a little bit, one more piece of a modification, we put drag chutes on the A4. Oh. So we could go into very short fields. Smaller we, airports. Yeah, yeah, we could go on four and 5,000 foot runways. Interesting. Okay. So as we transition to the end here, uh, you obviously were involved with the previous aircraft. They don't even fly the airplane uh, in the team anymore. Yeah. But just, I don't know, from your seat, what do you see? I mean, they just moved to the Super Hornet relatively mm -hmm. recently. But, right, I mean... Going forward, what do you see happening with the team? Now, other teams in other countries particularly will fly their trainers. Uh, you've got the Swiss team and the F5s. You've got others that fly PC, various things. I don't even know the nomenclature, but I probably should. 
What happens when we become a sixth generation Navy and Air Force? And well, we, it may have to do that just uh, just to stay in business. They may have to go to uh, a, a trainer because mm-hmm. uh, if, if if they're not buying enough of these airplanes, the airplanes are very ex- pricey now. Oh yeah, they're really really very. Right. Pricey. I mean, blue and gold F thirty fives would be amazing, but expensive. It, very expensive, yeah. And uh, I'm I'm not sure what difference it would make. The uh, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that much about the capabilities of that airplane over other than it's got some very st- specific things that are, are necessary, the mm-hmm. short landing and the vertical and all that stuff. And it's really impressive to see. Yeah. Really impressive to watch. Uh, but you can only do so much with it. Uh, you don't need the absolute front line right. thing uh, to, to bring people in. You want to show a show that's dynamic and professional looking mm-hmm. and uh, quick paced and, uh, and, and a group which they have, which are uh, impressive to look at, uh, the uh, flight suits that fit and the, and the fact they get quick to smile, good sense of humor and professionals. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got that. Yeah. Um, I know it's, it, it's going to be different in the future. It's, it's got to be. Right. Either, either we're going to get our head out of where it is and, and, and start – uh, look into the future for the country, or, or we're going to, you know, we're going to be back in the T twenty eight soon. Yeah. Well, but to be fair, I think venues are different and the audience is different. I mean, <laughs> the audience were still very, very vocal and very appreciative yeah. of what was there. Things have changed so much since the last time I went to an air show, though. I mean, the team didn't go to there. No, uh, they don't sign autographs. They don't uh, go to the, the crowd line anymore. Line, yeah. Yeah. They huh. do go out and do the pictures, do the eight mans out there. Uh, hmm. And there were three or four hundred people, two, three hundred people out there having that done, but they, they had to apply for it. Wow. But there were still a quarter of a million people at that air show and that, um, that didn't get to talk to the, the people. Right. Uh, that, that was one of the things I remember. And I, I still get things to this uh, two months ago, or not a, a year ago, I got a thing from a guy that makes lithographs. It, he started uh, drawing Ferraris years ago. Okay. Uh, and he sent me a lithograph of my airplane with my name on it from 1974. This was just two years ago. Uh-huh. And it said that going to your air show uh, changed my life. And I remember walking away uh, from the air show, and you took the time to stop and sign something for me. Um, this guy is he draws for car and driver and stuff i mean but he still mm. remembered it i've had several things like that happen uh to date and it's just taking the time to stop look a child in the eye mm-hmm. and and support him mm-hmm. and tell him yeah you can do this i i was right where you were mm-hmm. you can do whatever you want if you put your mind to it ultimately that is why the team exists I, to inspire that is, those young boys and girls that's right to go do it that's exactly right yeah. that, that's uh, and that's what Fortunately, Admiral Zumwalt ha- had the vision uh, to pursue. Good. And other people, too. Yeah. He wasn't the only one. But Good. I'm... Well, Turkey, you've been a lot of fun. Last time we talked to you about the future, you were already doubly retired now from both the Navy as a commander and your airline. So still playing golf. What else keeps you busy besides answering my phone calls? Thank well, you. Well, right. no, <laughs> keep, keep the calls and All right, coming, you. please. All right. um, no, I still play a little bit of golf. I haven't been here lately. We've... Uh, Working on the house, you know, just the stuff that uh, most people do at uh, at my age. You know, try not to fall asleep when my wife's talking to me. <laughs> Keeps me out of the yeah. doghouse pretty yeah. much. Well, I still surprise flight attendants when they ask if I want coffee, and I tell them I don't drink coffee. And I hate to admit this, Turkey, I don't play golf either. So uh, maybe that maybe you can work on me. <laughs> some pilot, right? Don't drink coffee. Don't play golf. But uh, maybe well, it's not too late. I I didn't drink coffee uh, till I got in the Navy, and then I get you go on enough cruises you got to do something that it was that or coke coca-cola <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh uh the coffee kind of stuck with me yeah for sure drink it black that way you don't drink too much because it's really nasty taste <laughs> <laughs> all right and then the last thing we always talk about here on the fighter pilot podcast is call signs now in episode 50 uh co-host sunshine asked you about that already we heard about your drawings and and everything else but let me ask you this then here's a twist because once you get to a certain age or rank, I feel like you should be able to pick your own call sign. So what cool guy call sign did you always want, whether secretly or otherwise, that you can disclose now to us? I mean, because there's some good ones out there, right? Assassin and Spine Ripper and Killer. And... Yeah, I've flown with 
two of those. Have you? Yes, actually. There's a spine ripper right now in the Marine he Corps. Was, I met was, him at an air show, and I said, there's no way, dude. Anyway. Oh, he was my CAG. Spine well, this is a different person, I, obviously. I know, but, but yeah. the, spine the real ripper, one. Yeah, yeah right. he was quite a guy. No, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have people that are very close to me that that's the only thing they call me by is turkey to now. I mean, and there are people that don't even know my name. To them, I'm turkey. So, uh, yeah, turkeys. Are, matter of fact, there was a picture just on, gosh, I think it was on Fox, where a turkey, a wild turkey got loose in a, a, in a room and just absolutely obliterated the room. So turkeys can be vicious, too. <laughs> I don't doubt that at all. Awesome. Well, Turkey, thanks so much for your discussion today and uh, helping us understand the F4 and the uh, Blue Angels and then the A4 as well. And you lived it. You were there a couple times. And Sounds like you uh, really cherish those memories. You know, thank you for the uh, the honor of being able to tell my stories. It's really fun. You're welcome.